Hello, is this thing on? Do you think they can hear us? Nah, let's say it again. Hi, and welcome to the Gritty Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to health and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or any other podcast listening platform, don't forget to subscribe so you can get updates to when we have our latest episodes. Also, don't forget to rate and review us. And if you like what you're hearing and you love our advocacy work, don't forget to go to www.grittynurse.com and click on the donate button. As little as $1 or $2 a month for a total of $12 a year will help us with our monthly podcast costs such as website hosting, our hosting platform, audio equipment, and the time and energy it takes us to put out good quality episodes. We thank you and we appreciate you. Hi, everybody. I am so excited. We have been waiting months, right, Sarah, for this guest. I can't believe we finally connected. We're going to have this episode. And honestly, this is our wheelhouse too. Um, myself and Sarah are both um, obstetrical nurses. We have our background in maternal child. I have my master's degree in women's health. And I think this is just a very timely episode and also a celebration because her new book is out. So before I give any other clues away, Sarah, please introduce our guest. I am delighted to introduce this superstar guest. And before I get started, I'd like to say that I am a huge fan. I actually worked in a menopause clinic many moons ago. And so I feel I feel very connected to this topic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jen Gunter. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist with nearly three decades of experience as a vulvar and vaginal diseases expert. She is the author of the number one bestseller, The Va- Vagina Bible, and has been called Twitter's resident gynecologist, the internet's OBGYN, and a fierce advocate for women's health. She writes two regular columns for the New York Times called The Cycle and You Asked, and has written for a broad range of outlets from academic publications to The New Republic, Chatelaine, Self, The Cut, and many more, plus her CBC Gem series, Jen Splaining. Welcome, Dr. Jen Gunter. It's an honor to have you today. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm just going to start by saying um, you are the queen of all things related to women's vaginal health. You wrote the Vagina Bible and now the Menopause Manifesto. Can you tell us a little bit about your new book? Yeah. So the Menopause Manifesto was basically an answer to what I heard on press tour for the Vagina Bible. Everywhere I went, I was asked about menopause. And it seemed women you know, were not only desperate to have information about what was happening to their body and about treatments, because many had been dismissed, but I also heard that you know women didn't have any culture in menopause, that they felt that, you know, this was just, they felt alone and lonely. And so I, I wanted to also give them information about how we got to where we are with menopause and where it fits in evolutionarily speaking. Yeah. I mean, like if I think about my own background and my culture, so like I'm from a Westine background in terms of us talking about menopause and these various different things, the word actually never really came up. Like I think in our culture, we had a variety of different ways of explaining what might've been happening, but we actually never talked about the word menopause. So, I mean, what were some of the real pearls that you found from your book in terms of what women really wanted to hear about? I think, you know, first of all, women wanted to hear about what to expect. And so just, you know, just as you said that, you know, in your culture, discussing menopause wasn't common. I mean, that's sadly common across many cultures. And, you know, while many, even many cultures obviously have problems discussing puberty and menstruation, but but by and large, that's sort of improved. And even if you don't learn about it, those things at home, you know, there's novels with young, you know, young women and men going through puberty. There's, you know, coming of age movies. So there's kind of this general discussion, you know, there's an acknowledgement that this exists. And with menopause, it's just silence. It really is. You know, there seems that there's no greater shame than having an aging woman's body. 
Oh, absolutely. No, you, you hit, yeah, you hit the, the, the nail on the head because I, I even think about like my mother-in-law and I remember, you know, she hit 50 and it was just like this thing that she, like, she was so worried about it, worried about her body aging that I remember I'm, I'm a horrible daughter-in-law. I remember kind of poking fun at her and being like, Hey, you know, you know, now you're, now you're hitting the golden age, you're hitting the menopause era. And she looked mortified. And, um, I had to stop and kind of take myself back, right? Because I was like, oh, you know, like I didn't realize how, because I'm not at that age as yet. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm coming, I'm approaching my 40s, but I'm not, I'm close to my 50s yet. And I didn't realize how sensitive of a topic it was um, with women. And I, I really feel that the conversation is hugely needed and it's important because there is stigma around um, some of the myths and misguided forms of information related to menopause and just women's healthcare in general. So kind of building on that there is so much health misinformation out there we are myself and sarah we're constantly fighting back whether it's covid19 related information or you know even information related to our bodies and health like we had someone reach out to us wanting to talk about jade eggs and we're like okay no we're not going down that <laughs> down that route right now we're just like i at first i was like sarah let, let's entertain the conversation and kind of like and she was like no we're not even entertaining. <laughs> and you know i i agree with her but there is so much misinformation out there. You don't hold back. We've seen some of your Twitter uh, fair against mainstream celebrities. Um, and we also think it's really crazy that celebrities feel that they have this monopoly on the, you know, kind of like in, in this healthcare sphere to talk about these strange healthcare products that they would call them. Why would you think it's important to take them on? Well, it's so hard for people to tell the difference between what is valid and what isn't when, you know, you're not an expert. And especially given the way that health information is presented now online. I mean, they're with influencers sort of blurring the line and even medical influencers, right? And so how do people know? How can people take away what's valid and what isn't? I mean, you know, Goop is a great example of of all of the things that are bad with with how health information might be spread online because they actually have some okay content as well as terrible content. So how can you tell the difference? And if you're selling stuff on your site, clearly you're biased and, and people don't, aren't, I don't really make that connection, you know, that, that, you know, having a store means you're completely unbiased, completely biased about the subject. And I think that, you know, the other important thing is, is that, you know, when you're not constrained by facts, you can say anything. So you have these sites that just are literally making stuff up and it gets repeated over and over again because of, you know, the way social media is. And we all mistake repetition for accuracy and, here you are in this swill of misinformation. Yeah, that's like the most dangerous part, right? Where, you know, there is all that information out there. like And like how you describe that, you know, um, people might not know that, you know, that is not the correct information. But I think we as healthcare professionals, we have to, we have to speak up. But that's one of the most difficult avenues, right? I don't see, there are, I wouldn't say there are a few, but I, there's not a lot of women that are out there openly dispelling these these crazy types of healthcare things that you know some of these celebrities and other people might be saying. So what do you think it takes in terms of, um, is, is it about being courageous or is it just about being, you know, this is the right thing to do? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, people have to get quality information from somewhere. And I think that, you know, speaking up against misinformation is really important. I think we've seen, we've all seen during the pandemic how politicized that has become and how people so easily can believe, you know, misinformation. I mean, the conspiracy theories and the, you know, this, how masks even became, like the concept of masks, you know, people, you know, people saying that you can't breathe wearing a mask. And I'm like, really? Have you ever seen an OR nurse or a physician in the OR or, you know, or an anesthesiologist? Right, 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 like right. We wear masks all day. You know? And so it tells us that these things prey on on us in a way that common sense can't even apply. So it's all hands on deck. Yeah. And I think we live in the age of Google where you can Google anything and everything. And there are so many, you know, theories out there that no matter how radical your theory is, you are going to find somebody online. You're going to find some Facebook group where people agree with these thoughts. 
And it becomes really difficult because there are some, you know, um, there's a lot of misinformation out there that looks very official looking. And when you have a celebrity sort of backing it, I think that there's a lot of confusion amongst, um, you know, the general public about what to believe, what not to believe. And when we don't talk about things like menopause, you don't get that sort of information passed down through your family. It just becomes, you know, very confusing where to go from there. Absolutely. So we have this huge information void. And of course, people should be able to turn to the internet. It's a great library. But, you know, so we have this information void with families not talking about. We have the information void with doctors clearly not providing the information people want to the government, not providing the information people want. And who do we have providing information? People who sell snake oil. So when you go do your Google (laughs) search, you don't have a chance. You know, there are many things that I look up for menopause and just to see what comes up. And it's the fourth or fifth page of the internet before there's anything that's actually factual that comes up on the subject. The first three pages are completely filled with influencers. And, uh, you know, if you're dedicated to um, jury rigging Google searches for your scammy product, it's very easy to do. Yeah. So bringing it back a little bit to your book related to the menopause manifesto. So, and it's speaking about so much help misinformation out there. What is one thing that maybe you can tell our our listeners out there that was a myth that you've busted in your book? Well, I think, I think one of the, I mean, so I could think about two, like a, a, a big myth is, uh, is that compounded hormones are safer. You know, they're not, they're less safe. And, you know, people are using unregulated, untested, unsafe products, and they may be getting more or less hormones than they need. And I hope that I've done it in a way that brings people on board, you know, explaining how the people who promote compounded hormones lie about, you know, how they're different and uh, really are not giving people factual information. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully I've busted that myth. um, So we'll see. Mm-hmm. I hope so too, because <laughs> I was I was going to say like uh, I'm actually going to buy this book for my mother in law, um, because she was actually going through quite the journey when it came to understanding what was happening with her body, mm-hmm. and um, it was it was very interesting because I think she started taking some of this information to her family physician, having those types of conversations, and then ended down the path of a you, you're you're probably going to be like irks in your seat, ended down the path of like naturopathic medicine. So she's on a variety of different things that I think are bogus. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, I think the, the best the best thing I could do for her is um, empower her with the most correct information and um, say, hey, you know, there's an expert out there that's writing a, some really good stuff on this. Let's take a look at it together. And maybe we can make we can make some better health decisions. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard because, you know, I mean, I see a lot of misinformation paths, like a lot. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, just significantly false information. And it's very hard for people to, to turn from having heard that because, you know, this naturopath has spent an hour in the office with them, probably on two or three separate occasions. You know, they may have paid $500, $800 per consultation. They've had all this unnecessary blood work. Maybe that's done that quote, quote, shows that they're on the right treatment, even though the blood work is, you know, a scam. (laughs) And so everything, this whole house of cards, has been built. And we all have this sunk cost fallacy, right? Like once we've put money and effort into something, it is hard for us to change our mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's hard to cut your losses and hard to walk away when you're really psychologically set on this path that you're going on. I've kind of been thinking about, you know, why the media hasn't covered menopause as much. And I just think that we live in a society that's obsessed with youth. And not only that, I think there is a lot of misogyny in medicine, kind of from our own experiences as nurses and healthcare, we faced gender discrimination. And I kind of wonder where do women begin and how do we, how do we attack this huge problem that we're having? Well, I think, you know, we attack it by talking about it. I think we have to have conversations. We have to say that it's not okay that we don't talk about women as they age. It's not okay that you know, that we tie a, a, you know, a woman's worth to a particular time in life when her ovaries were functioning in a different way. You know, I just think we have to demand better. We have to say, I want to see women of all ages represented, you know, in movies and, you know, in TV shows. I mean, we've all seen the 55 year old or 60 year old or older action star, right? Yeah. And, you know, his wife, the wife is 22 or 24. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
She, you know, yeah. and and then I mean, it was Maggie Maggie Gyllenhaal, a gorgeous woman. You know, I think she was in her like mid thirties when she said this. You know, so clearly looks younger than you know than she is, and she's too old to play the wife of someone who's in his fifties or whatever. Yeah, I that's mean, so messed up. That's messed up, and if that's the only imagery that you see. You know, you start to believe that why would you want to talk about menopause? Because it's graduating to irrelevance. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you saying that just kind of gives me chills because it's, it, it's it's so true. Like I'm thinking about it myself going, okay, so like thinking back to some of the movies that I've even recently seen. Yes. the If you think about even just the, the difference between the actor's age, like I was thinking about, um, I can't remember the name of the movie. It's it's slipping me now but I think the the difference in age I think the actress was something like she was around 19 and the actor was like in his 50s it's like well it's not even a fair match right that's that's not something that would actually happen yeah and, and, and I think that rings so true like it's just that they don't make for whatever reason aging women aren't sexy but that's definitely not the case mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, we have to ask all of society to do better because, I mean, in part, you know, I, I imagine it, well, maybe I'm probably not true, but I, I'd like to think that if, if movies with uh, women in their 50s, 60s and, and older were making hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, there'd be more of them you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there has to be somebody willing to take that chance. I mean, look at the roles that are offered to women in their fifties and sixties. You know, you're like right. a dowager, a plucky lady detective, you know, yeah. it's just all related to, you know, this vision of how women are supposed to be. And it's this patriarchal narrative of irrelevant or barely confident or, you know, crazy cat woman, you know, there's, there's only so many players you get to choose. And, you know, all the movies we see with women in their, you know, who are older, you know, all seem to be sort of tragedy related or, you know, like where's the, you know, I want heist movies with, with right. smart ladies in their 60s. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about the only movie that I can think of that even talks about menopause is that Sex and the City. I think it was the second one where um, one of them's going through menopause and she puts yam on her face like I kind of wish that <laughs> menopause was portrayed in a more positive light even the few times that it is in movies I, I think that would be really great for the image of menopause but I just don't we don't really see any of that it's really unfortunate yeah I mean the only the one movie I'm super excited about and you know maybe I'm going to feel comfortable enough to go see it in the movie theater is um, the fast and the furious nine <laughs> because um because <laughs> Well, Helen Mirren is playing yes. some badass, you know, woman who's an assassin. Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, and I obviously every woman who's over, you know, 55 is menopausal. So you, it doesn't really need to be spelled out. But, you know, she's sexy. She's incredible. She's taking charge. And uh, she's, you know, she's in some Porsche in the trailer with some guy much younger <laughs> than her. And she's basically giving him these instructions and tells him to do something with the car and he turns it sideways and she has these massive guns and she points her arms out her either window and takes down the car, you know, shoots the people on either side of the car. It's just this incredibly like powerful scene. And we need to see more of that representation. We need to see women in menopause doing everything. That sounds like a hit. You know what? And I'm surprised I actually haven't seen the trailer for that. So I'm going to definitely go search it now. You got, you got to see it. It's, it's really empowering. I have to say. Oh my goodness. And, yeah. This is what we should be seeing, right? I think there's these expectations that the only sexy woman is that, you know, 19 to 24. And that's not true. And I think that, you know, the more we see it in mainstream media, the more we see it in the news, the more we hear women talking about it, that we can kind of dispel some of these myths and talk about some of these different things. And especially in medicine, like actually I saw just today, but this particular doctor, um, I actually saw her tweet today and she was mentioning about, you know, hey, it's bikini season again. And there was actually an article that was written by um, some medical experts, and I'm going to putting this in air quotes, that mm -hmm. were saying that, you know, women wearing bikinis in medicine is not professional. And it started this one particular doctor started this whole kind of movement about, you know, um, this is my body. And professionalism has nothing to do with the way that I dress or the, the way that I appear or wearing, you know, whether I'm wearing a bikini. And I think that's mm -hmm. where we talk about that, this misogyny piece again, coming into medicine, just in terms of just everything that we see, right? I think men do have a large narrative and 
what the sexy female looks like. And I think we need to take that over again. Yeah. No, I, abs- I absolutely – yeah, I mean, but, you know, all we do is judge women, right? You're either you're either too old or you're too young. You're right. too sexy. You're too dowdy. You're too – you know, to be a woman is to walk on the edge of a knife. Yeah. No, you, you, you've got it. I, I, I agree. And it's, it's actually really tough. Like I'm, I have my daughter, I'm raising her. Um, she's six years old and I'm always kind of thinking to myself, like, how do I not, you know, put some of the, my own images of how a woman is supposed to behave or how a woman is supposed to be on her. Cause I mean, my mom, uh, my mom went to finishing school. I know I might be dating my mom, <laughs> but yeah, my mom actually went to finishing school in the Caribbean and, uh, she was, this very prim and proper. She expected me. She had these expectations of me. You know, yes, I I would be, I'd go to school and I'd be enlightened and I would do all these things. But still Uh my expectation was to be that woman making sure that I take care of my my husband. And um, I think I've sort of disappointed (laughs) her. Not saying that I'm not taking care of my husband, but just these ideas of, you know, what a woman should look like. I'm just not fitting that particular mold. But I'm going to switch gears a little bit because I went off topic. But Let's talk a little bit about sex. (laughs) Okay. Um, So I have a question for you. What is the Mm -hmm. average amount of sex that should happen or could happen after 50 if there is a if there is a number, let's say, and we know that menopause changes some things. So how do we keep that fire going when it seems like the fire might be fizzling out? Well, I don't think there's really any average or should with sex. I mean, sex, it's like telling people what you should have for dinner. Like, right. you know, <laughs> people like all different kinds of foods, they have different appetites, and you know, at different points in your life, you go through phases, right? Like, like I, you know, I'm going through a plant protein phase right now. I might not stay with it forever, but, you know, so I think that I think the most important thing we're talking about sex is that almost everything that people believe is related to a patriarchal narrative. It's right. related to this narrative of, you know, a heterosexual woman being hot and heavy every single time, you know, a <laughs> penis walks into the room, you know, the glory of the penis. And, you know, we know that um, sex drive or, you know, libido is is something that can come and go and that there are many factors that can come into play. And uh, the longer you've been with somebody, the more you have to work. I think at that drive. I think so. I think one of the falsehoods people has been so, people have been sold is that sex, you know, a sex life doesn't require cultivation, but it does. Right. It requires cultivation. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of people spend more time helping getting their kids to soccer practices or you know grocery shopping than they do planning their sex life. That right? is super true because they've been sold this narrative that it should you should be hot and horny all the time. Also, you know, many women have a receptive libido or that times they do. So meaning that they're not, they don't have a high spontaneous drive, but when the situation presents itself, that they are receptive to being sexually active and that sometimes even desire kicks in after physical arousal. So I think it's really important that people get educated about all those things and that we teach people that they have to tolerate, not only celebrate, not only the highs in their sexual relationship, but also tolerate the Mm -hmm. lows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so so speaking of menopause, definitely that that can have an impact for some people, but it doesn't for everybody. And sometimes it's related to other factors. So if you're up all night because you're hot, uh, that might affect and you're not sleeping well, that certainly is going to affect desire. If you've got depression triggered by menopause, that might affect desire. If your partner is, you know, not putting the effort in or you're, if you're, <laughs> you know, if you're the person who is doing the cooking and the cleaning and you're working from home and you're looking after the kids. And you're doing all that and, and then someone expects you to, to have sex every night. Well, right. most people are like, um, yeah, I, I'm really tired because I'm exhausted. So I think it's important that everybody step back and kind of look at what do they mean by low desire? Are they creating a situation where they can have the kind of sex that they want to have? And, you know, have they developed any pain with sex? Because, Mm. you know, if sex hurts, no one's going to want to have it. And certainly, you know, for some, some women, many women after menopause, they'll develop some vaginal dryness and that can be treated with estrogen. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting that you said that because I think that that might be kind of the reason why some women just don't. So I, I'm going to revert back to talking about with my culture. And this is way too much information that my mom gave me. And oh God, I know she listens to my podcast. I'm so <laughs> sorry, mom. Um, like she was, telling, she was telling me, she's just like, yeah, me and your dad don't do anything anymore because it's dry down there. I'm like, well, why didn't you fix the problem? Like if it's so dry, like just, you know, like go and talk to your doctor about it. But I guess that apprehension. Oh my God. My parents, they say the same thing. I know they're going to kill me for saying this too. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, so here's the deal. So first of all, there's treatment. Some people don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. And, you know, sometimes people have been told there's nothing right. too. So there's also that. But there's over-the-counter moisturizers for people that don't want prescriptions. But I'll tell you a lot of time, and this, I'm not saying this is what's okay. happening in your parents' relationships or either of you, but a lot of times there's also right, erectile right. dysfunction and the man can't have sex. And so the patient then blames it sort of on her dry vagina, but really there's kind of two things going on. I, I hear this all, all the time in the office. So I'll say, oh, well, we can fix that. You know, oh, he looks like, you know, someone might come to see me for another reason. And during the exam, it's clear they've got some significant vaginal dryness. And I'll say, gosh, things are really, seem really tender down here. You know, how are you having sex? Oh, well, we don't do that anymore. Oh, okay. Well, do you, would you want to? I can give you estrogen. And then, no, I don't think I want it. I'm like, well, really, the treatments are like really easy. I mean, there's even a ring. You can just put it in there and change it every three months. Like it's as low fuss as you can get. And then finally, after poking and prodding a little bit, it goes, oh, well, he can't anyway and right. he doesn't want to take any medication. So, because you have to remember, it is really common. And so a lot of times it's easier, it's, this is sad, but it's easier for the woman to blame her vagina than to blame her partner for not wanting to take, you know, medication. I mean, I see patients all the time who want to have a sex life and their partner refuses to take drugs for erectile dysfunction. Wow. Refuses. That's so bizarre. Well, you know, isn't it? <laughs> like, did they ever give you a reason as to why? No, but you know, a few years ago, Viagra made an ad specifically for that. Like they were basically targeting women. Um, Hey, try to like get your man to go into the doctor to get a prescription. Wow. That's unreal. Yeah. I, so, you know, so while there's some who do, I think that this sort of toxic masculinity, sort of men are virile all the time. I think that really yeah, affects men too. No, I, I I agree with that. But I'm I'm just envisioning my mom like you know walking down the aisle in Walmart or whatever, trying to look at lube, looking over her <laughs> shoulder, making sure nobody is looking at her. I th like I just I can't like I feel like my mom would be more. She would she would ask me to get it and like, <laughs> and then give it to her. Like I that's how I would see it. And it's just like within that culture, it's just it's such a scary thing to talk about. And then honestly, that right. toxic ma masculinity. Like I know my dad being like a Jamaican man. I don't think they it would fly even talking about it. And I think. I, I mean, I think there's so much more in terms of the conversation that we need to be having just generally that we don't have these issues because I think that sex is something that should be celebrated, not something that, you know, you hit this age and you're like, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. It's that there's a time for that. And now we're, we don't do that because I, I don't think that there's an age limit on when when sex should begin and when sex should end. Right. Right. I think in Asian culture, too, it's very um, not discussed because I remember asking my grandma about menopause and I had to actually explain to her what that was like you know it's when your period stops and she had to think about it and she's like oh yeah you know that happened 30 years ago but I don't really remember much about it so it was almost like it she didn't even have the awareness of what it was because it was never discussed like she didn't even know the term for it so I think that is common in the older generation but I would like to think that in our generation and you know our kids generation we can discuss it more and kind of take a proactive approach to it. Yeah, I think, you know, but getting back to the people who don't feel like they can talk about it, you know, that's my hope with the book is that, you know, if they read it and they're like, oh, I could get this vaginal moisturizer and they could just order it online so no one would know and it can be delivered. So if they're, you know, if they're uncomfortable going to the store, they can just a few clicks online. But yeah, I mean, isn't it sad? I mean, that, that your grandma didn't, even know the words for what was happening to our body. I mean, think about like, that's just, imagine if you got pregnant and you had no idea what was going to happen, like nothing. Like, and so then when your nice. belly starts to grow and it's starting to move, you're like, whoa, what is this? Like, like that seems to be like part of the knowledge, like the level of knowledge some women are at and it's just not acceptable. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that because I, I think back to like my grandmother. So my grandmother, um, she's, she's, uh, she's passed on now, but she had, um, she had 13 children. So she started quite early. I think she was around, um, maybe 15 or 16 when she first, um, had her first child 
And I remember actually talking to my grandma about menopause and she said to me that there's no such thing. She's never experienced that at all. (laughs) But you're right. It's probably because they didn't have a name to describe what was actually happening with her. And I mean, maybe in the Caribbean, the heat was different. So like she was maybe hot all the time or all these other symptoms that she had. She just passed it off at being something else. But I actually remember her saying to me that she's like, I I don't know what you're talking about. This, This thing never existed I, I don't have that problem. Right. But you're right. It's those words just might not be there. So how would you educate other cultures? Because I mean, this isn't a question that we typically have, but like, how would you educate other cultures that might not know about other than, you know, just through your book, like, you know, the patients that might come in to see you? Yeah. I mean, you know, just doing your best to have conversations, you know, making sure that you have, you know, the appropriate, um, you know, interpreter for, uh, you know, for situations when, you know, language you know, when you don't speak the same language. Um, also, you know, assuming it's important for providers not to assume that that patients even know the basics, you know, because right. sometimes they just come in and they, they have no, they just have no, um, no idea about it. And you have, we have to recognize that that's unfortunately a, a cultural force that, that we need to work against. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Dr. Jen, do you have any questions for us? How do you think we can get more information out there to to women from you know who come from other cultures who you know may have grown up in in a in a home where talking about anything related to the reproductive tract was just you know not allowed? I mean, because I see there's also plenty of women born in America in very you know religious upbringings that have the exact yes. same experience. You know, this everything is just cloistered. You know, there's no people have literally no awareness except you know, maybe what they read in teen magazines. So how, how do you think we should approach that? That's a really good question. So I'll talk, I actually haven't disclosed this before. So this is very interesting to, uh, to those that might be listening. So I actually came from a very, very staunchly religious home, like very, very religious uh, Pentecostal Christian home. And sex was like, like there was no discussion. <laughs> it was just right. like, it was like, I'd ask my mom and she'd like, the Bible says you can't have sex. Boom. Bible closed. Like that was it. Right. And then, <laughs> and then for me, my sexual experiences started at a younger age because instead of having, you know, that, that curiosity or, at, or having, you know, my mom or my dad at, answer the question, like my dad was just like, no, like even my period, it was like, no, I, those things just never went in that direction. He just, he just didn't even want to know about it. But like, when I think about, you know, my own sexual experiences as a, as um, I don't want to say it, it wasn't, I wasn't a youth, but as a, like a mid-aged teenager, I think it was because I didn't have that information. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the, the best thing is to start talking about it early and open as soon as you can. Like, like, I, I don't think people should be afraid of their bodies. I don't think women should be afraid of their bodies. I remember actually, um, the very first time where we had sex ed, and I think it was like maybe grade five or grade six, everyone was squirming. I already had taken the mirror down there and it was like, I kind of uh-huh. have an idea of what's happening. Like, I don't know where uh-huh. everything's coming from, but like, you know, I think that we have to have a culture where talking about our bodies, our women talking about our bodies, we can be open about it. And I think that there there is a lot of work to do. And especially with cultures that, you know, might be very religious. I think it, that's where it's really, really difficult. Because I mean, you would think that the stats would show that, you know, people th- that people who are more educated would be more likely to engage in sexual behavior, where it's quite the opposite, where, you know, the less education, the less resources, the less open dialogue, the more likely that, you know, that teenager might become pregnant, or they might have poor sexual experiences. So I think yeah. just having an open and honest dialogue right off the hop and talking about it. And even, and now I'm going to bring it to like even nursing school. Like they make it super uncomfortable, even in nursing school, when we're talking about like the physical assessment or, you know, let's say we have to do an assessment on, on a woman's vagina, or we have to put a Foley catheter in. They make everything like this, this very touchy. Oh, it's, it's so uncomfortable. Yes, it's Uh uncomfortable, but these are things that are a part of the normal human body and we have to talk about them openly. So I think my first take would be, we need to discuss about it, discuss about sex and sexuality and these things much earlier to dispel some of these myths and just really like, you know, let people ask questions, whether whether people think they are silly or not. I think it's important to talk about these things. Yeah, I absolutely agree. 
Yeah, and if I could jump in there, I think um, there should be more of an emphasis on women's health in general in nursing school. Um, I'm not sure what's covered in medical school, but I remember in nursing school, the only thing that was ever discussed about older women was osteoporosis, and they totally skipped over menopause. And um, in my experience, when I worked at the menopause clinic, there were women who waited six, 12 months before they got into this clinic to see an OBGYN that specialized in menopause. And by the time they got to her, they were just desperate. And I really wish that, at least in Canada, I wish that there was more of an emphasis on menopause so that family doctors could, you know, help these women manage their symptoms a bit better rather than sending them to the only specialist in the whole city and making them wait for that long period of time and just sort of dragging out that whole experience. So I think that if there could be more knowledge sharing, I think that would also help the whole um, experience of going through menopause. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I, I don't understand why people have to go see an expert or a lot of the symptoms. I mean, many of the medications that are prescribed are things that family doctors should be comfortable with. And, you know, the initial therapy you know, menopausal hormone therapy. I mean, and there are other therapies too, but for somebody who's otherwise at low risk, there's essentially, you know, it's about as low risk as you can be to do a six month trial of the hormones just to see how they help. Right. So, and then a decision can always be made to continue or not, you know, so there's no reason why someone should be, you know, suffering for those six months while they're waiting, something could be done to start. And so hopefully, you know, my hope is that my book also helps to educate, you know, physicians as well as patients. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I think to myself about my mom's journey and I kind of remember watching it as, as, as it unfolded as I was younger. And I remember when she kind of got to the point where, with her menopause journey, I and, I and I always worry about it happening with me. And I don't think it'll happen the same way. But mm-hmm. I remember her, um, you know, she was bleeding, she had endometriosis. And her bleeding ha- had gone on so long. And this was probably in the early 90s, that instead of having, you know, I think the surgeries and things are much difficult, different in terms of how it's handled, mm-hmm. they took everything, like they just took everything. And I mean, I, I think that's where a lot of women are concerned too, right? It's just like, and I think we, we attach so much of our emotions to those, those reproductive organs, to our uteruses, to Mm -hmm. our fallopian tubes that when everything is gone and, and I'm, I'm doing this homage to my mom, because I remember how painful it was for her that when those things are gone, you just feel like less of a person. So, I mean, I think that I'm glad that we're having these conversations. I'm glad that the therapies have changed because that was a huge fear of mine that, you know, they take these things from me. I'm not the same person that I'm go- going to ever be. And I mean, I look forward to reading your book and celebrating and reading it with my, with both of my, like my mother and my mother-in-law to seeing how, how we can better empower women on their, on their journeys to understanding their bodies much better. So I'm so thankful for you, Dr. Jen, that we, we had the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I was going to say, is there anything that we missed that you would like to cover or discuss? No, I think, before I, we go? No, I think we had a, had a lovely conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. And how can people find you or follow you? How can they um, buy your book? Yeah, they can follow me. Uh, well, they can buy my book anywhere books are sold. And and they can find me at Dr. Jen Gunter uh, on Twitter. They can find me, um, my Substack, uh, which is my new blog, is The Vagenda, V-A-J-E-N-D-A. And uh, that's uh, you can also find that at drjengunter.com. And oh, you can also listen to my new podcast called Body Stuff, which is produced with the TED Audio Collective. And that's just kind of debunking myths in all different areas of health. That is amazing. I am so glad we asked you that last question because uh, that that I I am going to put every woman in your direction to make sure that they listen to your podcast, uh, that they buy your book. You are an inspiration, Dr. Jen. I am so glad that you were able to come on today. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. You take care. Thank you so much.